This session will show how the OAAF, the Open Agile Architecture Framework, can help architect the change journey of enterprise transformation and will throw some light on the next OAAF development iteration. So a warm welcome, please, for our three speakers. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Ron just talked about autonomous things and robots. Uh, during that se this session today, we'll talk about autonomous human beings and teams. So it will be complementary uh, because we, we think that human beings and teams are also central to digital and agile transformation. Since the AF snapshot was published last July, we have collected feedbacks, uh, identify improvement opportunity, engage in conversation with actual forum officers. And since the AF contains a lot of new material, uh, some of it uh, being a, a real paradigm shift compared to traditional action method, we acknowledge the need uh, to have meaningful conversation with the enterprise uh, architect community. And we thank the executive and the staff of Open Group to give us the opportunity to share our view on the next iteration of the AAF. Uh, the Open Group uh, uh, is not alone in that broad agility market, and especially uh, an event occurred on October the 2nd, so very recently. Uh, SEF, the, the Scale Agile uh, Incorporated Organization, announced uh, the new version of SEF, SEF.5.0. Uh, Though this version has not been published yet, uh, the preview starts by acknowledging that agile product delivery is not enough. Uh, you need business agility, and here I am quoting uh, the uh, SEF preview. Since uh, the beginning, the EF uh, took uh, enterprise agility and business agility as one of its core, uh, let's say, objective and, and scope. So, uh, f from this standpoint, uh, we think that uh, there is convergence uh, on the market. Uh, and, and since also uh, SEF is starting to talk about business agility, which is quite new, uh, we think that uh, we will start this morning presentation also talking about business agility and sharing some thought with you about business agility. The second major change that SEF uh, did was to add customer focus or centricity to the big picture. You, you, you know the self big picture with a lot of things, not very readable, but now you've got customer centricity at the middle of it. Uh, VF snapshot has also put customer at the center, uh, but we talk about customer experience and uh, we think that uh, it's another indication of, of uh, the convergence of, of direction here. Uh, I will not continue to do that comparison point to point, uh, but just say that though SEF moves I into a direction that is very aligned with VF, it's still weak on the actual side. And, and we believe that uh, it's really the sweet spot of AF to actually uh, provide the architecture knowledge, know-how, and methods to enterprise that uh, move toward agility at scale. Uh, we will start uh, the uh, presentation by uh, talking about the case study, uh, because we realized that in order to present these new concepts, you need to illustrate them with concrete uh, examples. So that uh, case study will be in the banking domain uh, and we will present first 
how that bank operates before the agile transformation, and we will show how the bank is transforming toward uh, business agility and, and, and agile operating models. So let's go to slide two. Yes. So the salad organization that we present here, I mean, is very uh, similar to many of the bank's organization with variation that we, we can find. Uh, that organization uh, does not facilitate outside in thinking because it's really siloed oriented and uh, it does not also facilitate cross-functional collaboration. Therefore, the bank is slow to collect weak signals, give meaning to them, and respond rapidly uh, to those uh, uh, weak signals. Uh, and the bank, when it has to change, changes through waterfall programs uh, that focus on the run side of the bank, and those programs take a lot of time to deliver. On slide three, uh, it's a simplified view of, of an information system that many banks uh, share in terms of uh, variation of it. Uh, in those type of system, one change in one application impacts many more applications. It creates many dependencies, and the, the result is that uh, it takes a lot of time to implement new products, new requirements, uh, because of those dependencies. And the monolithic nature of those type of system uh, end up costing a lot uh, and, and slow uh, innovation a lot. So in contrast, uh, we will define uh, business agility. And for us, uh, and we were inspired by a, a book published recently, which title is See Sooner Act Faster from the MIT Press, where business agility is the ability for the enterprise, here for that bank, to see sooner, so to, to sense what's going on in the market, what do the competitors, what client wants, and act faster. And in the example that we presented uh, before the Agile transformation, uh, the headquarter identifies potential threats and opportunities, and it takes a lot of time to go through the other silos, because in general it's marketing that sense, uh, and to uh, result into uh, giving meaning to those uh, signals, and it takes uh, a lot of time to actually respond uh, to, to those signals. In contrast, we think that agile teams that are uh, teams of teams sometimes which are closer to the field uh, can uh, see earlier than others. And because they are autonomous, they can respond more rapidly. Uh, and we'll see in more detail uh, how that uh, agile transformation really improves uh, the speed of sensing and the speed of acting to respond to, to those changes in the environment. Uh, this requires this model requires, as we said, autonomous teams uh, that are cross-functional, and this is what Jean-Pierre is going to present uh, in the next slide. Yes, thank you, Frédéric. So, um, as you can see in this slide, the, the business is now organized to meet the needs of market segments. You have two, two examples, the consumer market and the SME market. Not, not this one. Yes. Oh, excuse me. Uh, tribes, which regroup small teams named squad, own a product family, or for example, consumer credit, or a part of uh, exp or, or customer experience. 
tribes and uh, squads are aligned to streams of work that develop and deliver products and customer experience. These agile teams are cross-functional to reduce friction between the, functional, the traditional functional silos of the organization. All relevant competencies and skills um, are represented, included, of course, IT. Agile teams have business KPI, such as revenue growth or profitability. These teams have the freedom to make business decisions and are accountable for business results, of course. Cross-functionality is facilitated, at, least, but at last but not at least, by the reorganization of working space. Building floors are no longer dedicated to a function, such as marketing or IT. Building floors regroup all the people who are working on the same product or customer journey. Both all teams mix business and IT competencies. So an agile organization, reshaped teams, reshaped offices, needs collaboration tools and, of course, new ways of working. Agile ceremonies are part of these new ways of working. So perhaps in an agile organization, localization and composition of teams are different, but what is the main difference is the governance. The way these autonomous teams are governed is quite different. The strategy is deployed through assigning objectives and KPIs to tribes. Tribes have the freedom and resources to be able to decide how they are going to meet their objectives. Business objectives and budgets, included IT budgets, are reviewed together every quarter. Unlike managing yearly budget cycles, the agile organization is able to manage quarterly budget cycle. The tribe sponsors assign objectives and targets KPIs. Objectives and KPIs are covering both the change the bank and the run the bank. Agile ceremony are used to decompose objectives, manage backlogs, assign work and allocate resources, both on the change the bank and both on the run the bank. At the end of each quarter, Agile teams conduct retrospectives about sales, about projects. Post-mortems are conducted and analyzed to improve ways of working and optimize resource allocations. The biggest shift is to combine business objectives and IT objectives, business KPI and IT KPI for the same tribes and the same teams and assign, and assign them to the tribe leaders. This slide summarizes the current situation that the, the semi tribe has to improve and the objective it has been assigned. The three major problems in this example, the SME tree need to address are improve the competitivity of its offering and to boost sales, of course, to reduce economic and regulatory capital consumption, and to fix legacy system, information system, which gets into the way of a good client experience and costs too much to run and to maintain. So in this organization, cross-functional teams are accountable for both business and IT outcomes. An example is of this is the objective to reduce the capital consumption. This reduction needs both a business objective, which is improving the loan product and to increase sales, and an IT objective, which is to improve calculation engine or both um, the reduction. So, Frederick now will uh, summarize the lessons learned from this new organization. Uh, thank you, Jean-Pierre. And uh, just for those who are not in the bank banking industry, SME stands for small and medium enterprise. So, it's, it's a market segment within the banking industry. Uh, so, now uh, we'll talk about uh, the uh, attention points uh, when the, the bank has uh, deployed that model. Uh, what we are showing uh, 
is a situation where the bank has only deployed a jail at scale that way uh, at the headquarter, excluding the branches and the middle offices. Uh, the attention point on the left uh, reflects the shortcoming of these dual models. Uh, because of that uh, uh, dissociation of, of the design and execution, so to speak, uh, they, there are some tension on budget, commercial priorities, and, and also the interlock with other initiatives uh, it's less easy. Uh, for instance, leveraging uh, loans to small and medium enterprise to cross-sell cash management services to that same market segment. Uh, the key success factor on the right uh, uh, applied to most of the tribe we, uh, we've reviewed. Uh, freedom need to be balanced by accountability, teams, uh, need to be small and stable. Uh, we need to have enough experience, expertise in those teams so that they can be autonomous. Uh, I will not uh, quote all the success factors, but just, just to give you a sense of, of uh, what, what good looks like. Uh, greater agility can be achieved by extending the agile organization to the branches and the middle offices. So uh, we think that uh, the current state is not yet ideal. And uh, though the headquarters is now agile, uh, the field is still organized on a geographical basis. I mean, people uh, work for branches, and branches are located in uh, various uh, geographies. The bank is considering extending the scope of tribes and branches to, to branches and middle offices. So it's, it's on the left here. Instead of being separate, uh, it would be included in the tribes. Uh, that means that in that model, geography is less important. You can have someone who is selling or supporting SMEs it happens that they are located in one branch, but they no longer really report to the branch manager, but they report to the uh, tribe leader. Uh, Antoine will now describe the consequences of that new organization on, on the operating model. Antoine. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Frederick. Yeah, in the example that has been uh, achieved in the bank project currently in progress. Well, you can tell me, um, Jean-Pierre, you said that's not only happening to your environment, but you see this happening in many banks all over the places. So it means there are some pattern of architecture which underpin this approach, which b basically are the various aspects that we're trying to cover um, within the AAF. So at the very core of it is the notion of this product intentional architecture. It adopts, you know, we have all this term customer experience. This is really adopting this outsiding view for building the architecture. And it's going to drive the selected business outcomes that do matter for the customers and the criteria we're going to use for, to measure them. Yeah. And this outside in architecture, it shapes the way the enterprise is going to be organized. This is a team-based approach. And the way it shapes it is that we're going to mirror the product architecture with the notion of streamed aligned team, which is going to take into account front to back the way to deliver those business outcomes in a proper manner. So this mirroring approach right, is really how the intentional and operational architecture are going to be fit together. The streamed aligned team, because they cover the anti-value stream, by nature, they are cross-functional. This is not a layer approach to it. If you want those product architecture which match the customer experience to be effective, you need these streamed aligned teams. But if you only have those streamed aligned teams, you're going to lose the value of the entire enterprise and the common assets. So you must be organized to nurture the common value of the enterprise, the risk being that 
the stream align team becomes again silos. So, and this is done basically in two ways. The first one is to having a notion of competencies and supporting teams. Those competencies teams, they brought the, the know-how of the enterprise and the various disciplines, including legal, security, and you know what? The architecture, which is a key asset of the enterprise. It is not something that you're going to delegate and outsource. It is something you're going to nurture so that those trained aligned teams are able to do their business properly. The other part of it is the platform, uh, platform teams. So if you don't want each team to reinvent the wheel, you need to factorize, you need to mutualize, and help the team doing their core business while providing services that are enablers, and preferably self-services, so that you minimize the dependencies on the thing you rely on. The same thing if you're using the architecture team as a team where you delegate the architecture, in fact, you have dependency on that team. You don't have the knowledge within the tribe, and you wait for architects to be available to do your work. The same way the platform needs to provide services that you can use not being too much dependent on it, but leverage on it. Of course, when you have all this operating model working, you still have independent autonomous team. And for them to make up an enterprise as a whole, you need some common way to align them towards the common goals. Jean-Pierre already mentioned the way agile governance needs to be set up, which is tribe-based, with autonomy, with common ways of going in the same direction, with three main items that we'll develop later, which is a common purpose, shared consciousness, we'll talk about it, and the notion of guardrail, a way to control things with overseeing without being too much prescriptive. And of course, with all this, it doesn't make architecture static. There is going to be a continuous architecture activity that moves from that intentional architecture to operation on the grounds, getting the feedbacks. But because you're tribe-oriented or stream aligned team, the signal from the market, the connection to customer experience is going to be better. So lower signal are going to be heard earlier. The way to react is going to be done easily because you have the shared understanding on how to react and you have the direct uh, connection to the solution you're going to provide with continuous delivery. This means that the role of architecture is key in maintaining those various aspects. So if you have team leaders in charge of both the design of the run and the running itself, architects need to be close to this, to this uh, new leadership. They need to be friends of the team leaders so that this design and running can go smoothly within the organization. So where does it come from, all this? This kind of, it's a kind of breakthrough of the way we were doing traditional architecture. And I, I think most of you are aware of the thing called the Conway's Law, aren't you? Okay. Let me study it again. Any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization communication structure. So there is a very tight connection between the thing that design and the architecture of this thing being uh, produced. This is this idea of connecting together the design of the run and the run. And McCormack has demonstrated that loosely coupled organization develop much more modular design than tightly coupled organization. If you have a global team that work together, the tendency is to say, we share. So we don't APIs ourselves, I would say, <laughs> in a kind of brutal manner. So if you want autonomy, you need that line of communication that will need to formalize the relationship between the teams and between the systems they, con they conduct. So this is why this is what they call a team-first architecture. And to do it, they apply what they call the reverse convey maneuver, where instead of thinking of the architecture 
in an isolation, you go in to first shape the enterprise organization in a way that mirror, as we said, the product intentional architecture and the organization of the company. Yeah. Yeah, is it moving? All right. So of course, a key aspect, I'm, this, is, this is kind of my mantra, I would say, or preferred topic. The, the, the trick of architecture is to create boundaries. You know, life is a continuum. Yeah. You wake in the morning, you do things, at the end, you have done, you've done some work, but what is the aim of it? You know, in processes, you have the notion of operation, action, and you need to put boundary in be between processes. The trouble is all those boundaries are somewhat artificial. It's because you need to decompose things. You can't handle the whole world at once. Yeah? And the more system becomes complex, the more you need to decompose. And modularity is here to help us create those autonomous parts that we can manage. So that in a way that we minimize dependencies. It is if I change something, I don't want everything to be changed because I was so working at a such large scale that I don't have created those boundaries. Life is like this, you know? Cells create boundaries, then you have organism, then you have so society. So we all work in architecture by doing modules. Now we need some criteria how to do this modularization. And we've seen three of them, I'm going to summarize three of them. The one is the journey, the step journey, the business outcomes that we got from the product architecture we said at the beginning. Another criteria, as we've seen, is the value stream, which is going to provide us the scope, the back and front to back scope that make up the boundary of the team. Right? And the third one, which is another topic we have in, in, in the uh, um, Agile architecture framework, is a thing called domain driven design. How you split the domain of activities in terms of resource being managed, activities being performed in a manner that you can split them and provide those resources with some kind of, again, some kind of interaction API that provides a proper dep in a dependence between the module. When you've got that split, of course, you minimize the dependencies, but you can't help having dependencies, otherwise, again, you recreate silos. The goal is to manage those dependencies in such a way that they become non-blocking. So what do we mean by non-blocking? We mean that they don't go out of the scope of the, uh, of, of the team which has the dependencies. So first they need to be identified, then they need to be owned, and then of course, if you don't have control over them, like you have some resource or some architects you rely on, but they're not available, and you don't have the skill of architecture, you have no autonomy, so what do you do? You wait, this is a blocking dependency. So you must organize the dependencies so that they are non-blocking. And one clear way to do it is to provide self-servicing. I can provision the resource myself. I know it, I've been taught how to do it. It's provided by another team, but I can exercise it myself. Next. Taking notes again. So, as we've seen, now we, you need the alignment part. You know how to run, you know how to decompose, you know how to manage dependencies. How can we do to become together? So, um, Jean-Pierre mentioned some mechanism to do the agile uh, governance, and I, I want to, to note three other items here. The first one is a shared purpose. Of course, you need a shared vision. You know where, where to go. This notion of purpose, the raison d'etre of your organization, the raison d'etre of the system, is what makes you happy <coughs> and what makes you understand what you're doing. Of course, to do this, you need some kind of awareness. If the understanding of where you want to go is only split by a team, there's no way you're going to come together. So as General Mac um, Stanley said, this global awareness is having a global, uh, the holistic viewpoint of your organization. It's not something you need to hide. You're not going to hide information for power. You're going to share it for the global understanding. It doesn't mean you need to be a generalist, a generalist team. You need to know everything. 
you need to know where you go together. This is a mantra, think globally, act locally. And the last thing you need to have is that kind of how you make things happen in a kind of rigorous manner so that you go all together in the same direction. Do you do control, procedure, going in each uh, room and checking that the work is done? That's a traditional command and control. So you provide those notion of guardrail, force function, which provide you guidance, which empower people by providing rules, guidance, you know, you know that well, all architect, architecture principles, but this is beyond architecture principles. All the things that rule the way you're going to go together. So now that we've summarized the various pieces of architecture landscape, Frederick is going to tell us how it applies to the IT departments. Do we still have IT departments? <laughs> So just because Antoine uh, talked about platform in, in one of the previous slides, uh, I'd just like to share with, with the group that uh, Christophe Klein from BNPP and myself uh, will do a presentation tomorrow afternoon that will focus on, on that aspect, uh, platform, and especially how you enable digital platforms. But coming back to, which is part of information technology, Coming back to information technology, you remember we said tribes own their IT. Does it mean that the central IT department disappears? No. Uh, it's only uh, the capability that are critical to the success of the tribes that move under the control of the tribes. Uh, there is still room for a central IT organization. Uh, for, for instance, operating the infrastructure, uh, for also legal and investor obligation, and also shared capabilities. Uh, the other aspect uh, will be uh, that refactoring, that modularization uh, that Antoine uh, uh, presented as, as so important. So we will move now uh, quickly. Uh, I just want to uh, introduce an approach that actually you can read in the EF snapshot uh, around how to handle the legacy system. But the idea is that in the heyday of SOA, people believe that just creating APIs on top of legacy monotech system uh, was going to make the system uh, agile. And actually that's not true because Actually, those APIs do not shield from knowing the internals, which means that you've got abstraction leak, uh, meaning that the consumer of the API need to understand too much of the implementation behind the API, which creates further co coupling. So that's why uh, SOA actually resulted in higher coupling uh, as before, though it was not the original intention. So, what is uh, important is uh, uh, the uh, number three is to start modularizing the system. So you start to do it uh, at a coarse grain level. You create a separate subsystem. You connect them through APIs or events. And, and then you can start implementing yet uh, finer grain services called microservices. Uh, that will uh, redevelop the functionality of a subsystem. And that's uh, number four. Uh, in a way that will be, uh, that provide much more modularity and agility. Uh, and at the end of the day, when you've done that for a subsystem, you can decommission that part of the subsystem. And that's called the stronger pattern. And at the end of the day, you get rid of the old system. And that's also described in the AF uh, snapshot. Uh, second thing, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, change in the way you look at the world, instead of looking at architecture as layered, business, information system, technology, you take the business domain and you 
start modularizing the system based on the business domain. Uh, I will not go uh, for the sake of time in more detail in presenting uh, the concept that helped do that. Uh, it's uh, the strategic pattern of domain-driven design. For those who are interested, you can find that material in the EF snapshot. Uh, let's say that uh, the idea is that you directly implement your business ideas uh, in your uh, software systems. So there is a, a much direct connection between uh, business, so to speak, and, and software. Uh, so, uh, as we have uh, seen during all the presentation, all that requires a lot of change. And change, succeeding that change uh, is really a profession. And yes, thank you for like, effectively uh, transforming an organization in a, an agile organization is a change management stake. So, it, it's, it's not Big Bang, it's uh, in three stages. Successful leaders follow three stages. The first stage is to build a strong coalition, assembling an executive team, and this team must collaborate effectively. It's not a question of a sponsor, it's a, question, it's a matter of a coalition of sponsors. And this, this sponsor must uh, create a real team. This coalition needs to have a non ownership mindset and have, uh, to have some architecture skills. Of course, you see to design the right, uh, the right tribes with the right IT. The second stage is this uh, coalition has to identify and to mobilize the right builder management pioneers. These pioneers will be the first tribe leaders about the most important uh, business uh, goals and the most important uh, IT pain points. The third stage is to create, to shape uh, squads, agile teams, and to provide support when needed by these uh, teams. Uh, in this organization, agile teams are free to engage honest conversation with executive sponsor, with the, with the coalition, and can share with them issues and particularly uh, innovation ideas. So agile transformation uh, truly requires a change in management style, moving to, from command and control to uh, a servant leadership with our architecture skills. It's the beginning of the conclusion. In terms of conclusion, we created that slide with three key messages, and we think that uh, those messages, uh, uh, you can read them, understand uh, them uh, easily, because it really uh, summarizes the idea that we have developed. But please take a few minutes uh, reading them to think about the questions uh, that you'd like to ask, uh, so we can move directly to, to the question uh, uh, part, uh, because I, I see the time is, is running fast. And thank you very much for, for listening to, to us. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's, uh, yeah, we have, we've had some questions coming in, but uh, it's not too late. You are going to need, well, if you go there, Frederick, you're going to need this. I'll move over here and then you can, that's probably the best way. Probably the best way of doing this. So um, anyway, we do have some questions come in. Um, do you see the role of solution architects becoming more engineering focused, working closely with DevOps, delivering within the boundaries provided by enterprise architects? So will solution architects become more engineering focused? I think one of the difficulties uh, transitioning toward that new uh, way of architecting is that uh, the same words uh, may have different meanings. Uh, when I hear solution architect here, I hear an architect.
architect that creates a, a sort of uh, IT solution that embeds processes and maybe business, but m mostly an IT solution. D during our whole presentation, we didn't talk about IT solution. We talked about architecting the agile enterprise. So uh, I'm not sure what the solution architect will do in the future, uh, but I think we have clarity about what architect needs to do to really help the enterprise become agile and digital. But solution engineering as a, as a discipline, as a cross-architecture discipline, is absolutely key, right? So for those teams to be uh, front to end, they really need to have solution engineering, and architects are the vector of it. So of course they need to know the te technology, they know to do how to do set-based engineering, they know concurrent engineering, that kind of skill is absolutely key for architecture to be a, a powerful discipline, yeah? Okay. Thank you, we'll move to the, the next question, probably one mostly for Jean-Pierre. Uh, what is the time scale that you had or expect on your journey and where are you at this point? It begins two years ago. Um, it's for my experience, it's, it will be a long way. What is important is in two years to, uh, to onboard the most important uh, business uh, tribe about the most uh, important objectives and uh, most uh, pain, point IT, pain points IT, uh, IT stakes. Well, and I think that uh, between four or five years, you will be able to transform a traditional bank from a old a legacy system to a new one and to a, a new organization. Right. Thank you. Do you have something to add, Frederick, or next question? Just to say that what Jean-Pierre is presenting, when we look at other banks that are doing the same thing, we are in about the, the same uh, type of time frames. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, is the fully agile operating model the death of intentional architecture? En uh, emerging architecture seems to be coming more and more common. Uh, uh, I would not say that. Re remember the diagram that uh, Antoine presented? Uh, the first input was that intentional architecture. Because if you don't have an intentional architecture, there is no way you can define the boundaries of your uh, agile teams, especially the teams of teams that are the tribes. But uh, that intentional architecture is there to be challenged uh, and is evolving. So it evolves uh, through those iterations uh, to uh, an emergent architecture. But, but both are necessary. Yeah, I could add, yeah, which I missed. Uh, the fact that those teams, all right, they also start from small teams, like the squad, and they can move to teams of teams, right? In the DP book, which is provided by the open group, they explain how this emergence happening when you move from squad to team of teams and the relationship between the internal and emergent architecture as you move from simple team where you hold everything to distributed teams and the emergence is going to roll out in different manner. So yes, look at the DP book for that also. Thank you, Antoine. You beat me to it. I was going to say that, but <laughs> you took my line. Thank you. OK, um, how do you manage the life cycle management of the platform or architecture across the various silos? And uh, how does this work for a domain-driven, model-driven approach? Uh, actually, we, we'll cover tomorrow afternoon with, with uh, Christophe Klein from BNPP, the, that topic. But l l let's say that uh, the key uh, is to create a uh, non-blocking relationship between uh, the, infrastructure, the platform teams being infrastructure or digital platform and the consumer of those platforms. And one example of non-blocking is the development of self-service. If you provide self-service to development teams, they don't have to wait <coughs> anymore for the infrastructure and ops team to get the resources they need to deliver the product. And therefore, uh, you've got a, a loose coupling between the platform team and uh, the uh, uh, consumer of those platform. And DDD can be applied both uh, on the business domain to 
uh, create uh, loosely coupled applications, but it can be also applied to the infrastructure domains to architect uh, the platforms themselves in a modular manner. The di key difference is that uh, for the platform, the domain concept will be uh, more technology concepts, uh, as in the application, it will be business concepts. Okay, thank you. Um, we're running out of time, but um, uh, I'll try this one quickly. Is there, a, is there a danger that decentralized tribal IT gets too big, or it doesn't have enough competence due to its size? We had a, a seminar also in France about what was not working in Agile, and that was exactly the problem that was faced. The lack of common assets mm -hmm. managed by architects and nurtured by architects, which led to poor, poor efficiency, finally. Yeah. So, of course, if you dis all the tribes in, in isolation, they will become silo again. And, of course, an organization is beyond those uh, streamlined team. It is all the culture. Uh, all the assets, the self-services that make, and you make must, you must have it running. So you must allocate part of your budget to nurture those common culture, for sure. And it's it's truly, and this is why we mentioned about safe and so on. They have a, a lot of things about it, but a good understanding on how to nurture this is a key role of us architects. Uh, and safe, uh, if you look at it, and maybe they will fix that in, in the new version 5.0. But they don't talk about the platform. They don't explain uh, how to articulate platform teams versus uh, uh, streamlined teams. So that's just an example of the weak actual weaknesses of Ceph. And that's exactly where we think that there is a sweet spot for the year. Gentlemen, in the interest of letting people go to the break, we'll leave it there. But thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre Lecam, Antoine Longin, and Frédéric Lay. Thank you very much, gents. Thank you.